Welcome to Accounting High. Now you have third-party reliance on your financial statements. And in that case, you need to tighten things up. So you may have a bank that's looking at your financials, or maybe you want to get a loan. You may have investors who are looking at financials, or you're trying to get investors. So this is anytime you need some more money to run the business, somebody's going to be making sure that they're going to get a return on that money and they want to see these numbers. They want to get clarity on on who they're lending to. Yes. And they need to be clean and tight because as soon as if you give over sloppy financial statements, you've immediately lost trust. And for someone to give you money, you need to be trusted, trustworthy. Check out the cash flow show. We discuss topics like getting paid on time, profitability, and managing your bottom line, payroll best practices, the best apps to use, and cash flow forecasting tools. So if you're a small business owner, your help's right around the corner. Fret not. Tune in as Scott and Nicole help you reach your goals on the cash flow show. The cash flow show. What's up, Nix? Hey, Scott. How's it going? Good. Really good. Pretty good today. How about you? I'm great. I'm great because this is episode nine of the Cash Flow Show. We're nine weeks in. What is in store for us today? What do you got for our students? Yeah, this is our last episode on our foundational uh, track. What would you call it? Track, yes. And then we'll get more uh, advanced next track. So today we're going to be talking about how to buy accounting services. Ooh. And th- this topic was inspired by an EO member in our SF chapter emailed me and he forwarded me a in-app advertisement for bench bookkeeping services that was in his Gusto account. So small business owner is in Gusto and sees an ad for bench. And I think as buyers of accounting and bookkeeping services, it's really, really confusing. And so I wanted to just do an episode talking through the different options that you have, whether it's an individual or a firm or an individual and a firm and what you need at different stages of your business. Because the thing is, is it will change. So if you have a solution in today that's working, you may grow out of that solution. So it's just business owners being able to self-recognize what they need so then they can go find the right support that they need when they need it. Dope, dope, yeah. Yeah, it can be pretty confusing out there in the market because accountants, you know, as we talked about in other episodes, we got CPAs that do all kinds of different things. There's no uniform way to buy accounting services. So hopefully we can provide that after today's episode, or at least provide you with a little bit more clarity on what you're going to get out there in the market. Yeah. And in a previous episode, and I think would be a good prerequisite if you haven't listened, is we talked about the roles in an accounting department. So we've talked about this idea of a bookkeeper, controller, a CFO, and then you have your CPA or EA who's doing your taxes. Definitely go back and listen to that episode if you have not, because it will be helpful in understanding what we're talking about today. Those are all the questions that, you know, as a business is growing, do you need somebody to just do the bookkeeping? Do you need somebody to handle just the bookkeeping and the taxes? And then at what point are you going to need to go even further than that and to start looking at an accounting department? So let's let's start talking about that. Yeah. So I like to think of it. So 94% of small businesses are under a million, I believe it is, and like 4% are one to 10 million. So basically like almost all businesses are under 10 million in revenue. So I like to think of it in revenue stages. That's sort of helpful. And then also a question that we ask on our intake form when a prospect books a call, sales call with us is how do you use your financial statements? And the four options are to file a tax return, to manage my business and make decisions, which hopefully people check that one. 
<laughs> Hopefully people check both of the first two <laughs> boxes. Uh, third option being, I have investors who look at my financials. And then the fourth option is I have a loan or want to get a loan. And so a prospect may check one or all of those boxes or something in between. And what I'm doing there and why that's important is because the way that a business owner uses their financials drives the services or people that they need to help them achieve those goals. Right, right. And that determines what kind of level of service they can get from you when working with you and how you guide that relationship. Because there's also another option is I'm looking to sell my business. And that's a whole other reason to use financials too. Yeah. So that's actually a separate question we ask is when do you plan to sell your business? And then oh, you okay. can put like a range there. That's also important because a lot of times that's why they're changing something, right? Usually there's a reason why someone reach out, reaches out and oftentimes selling their business is part of that. So that's a conversation we want to have because that also impacts who you'll need. So you mentioned most businesses, over 90% our, of businesses are under a million or about a million or less. Right. 94%. Yeah. Most 94%. businesses are under a million. And so for them, what's the most, what does a business under a million even need? Okay. Yeah. So think about it when a business owner first starts their business, typically they're okay. I need to send out an invoice as the first thing I need to set up my LLC or S corp or whatever the entity structure is. And then they're getting in. Okay. Now I'm sending out invoices. I have transactions. I need to do basic transaction booking so that I can give that information to my tax accountant to file a return. And so at that point, under a million, your needs are pretty basic. Either you're DIYing it, putting together things on a spreadsheet, or you might have an inexpensive bookkeeper. And going back to when we first opened the show, talking about bench, we can talk about that for a second. But you're looking for a very basic cash basis, transaction booking, really nothing beyond that at that stage. Sounds like what my firm does for most of our clients. Right. And so, and that's one thing I also wanted to point out is your business is typically marketing toward under a million revenue businesses, right? Who you work with, ideal client profile. Um, No, I mean, we take more too. We just don't, we tend to not do this extra stuff that we're going to be talking about, like accrual and all that. Um, Okay. So you usually do cash basis. Let's just say- Two million or less, typically, and and typically you're handling those books in such a way so that you can use them to file a tax return would be yep. the primary purpose. Okay, um, so that's a different. I think mean, that's that's good that we're both here because while we're in the same industry, we have different target markets and different types of clients. So, like the type of client that you would work with, if they came to us, I would say, hey, we're not you're not a good fit for us. Like, go work with Scotty's firm. Because we don't do taxes. And so I found that our best client is over a million when we're actually getting into financial operations, accrual-based accounting. And then we're typically working with an outside tax accountant or the business owner is either bringing a CPA relationship with them. We're working directly with them, but we're not getting into the tax. So those two things have become two separate rather than under one umbrella like they might be with your firm. Right, right. And if it's a bigger business that's not you that has an in-house accounting department, we're just doing the tax return. Oh, interesting. Okay. So in that case, so going back to that the first question that the gentleman in my EO group was asking, bench would actually be a great solution possibly if they're really really micro business and they just needed transaction booking. And your firm would also be a more personalized option probably if you want to talk about the difference between something like Bench versus going with a firm like yours? Yeah. I mean, I've never worked with Bench, but I'm sure it could be very comparable. I think working with Bench would be like working with the second layer of our team um, without having a lot of that face-to-face contact. I think a lot of that is stuff that's getting done behind the scenes and you don't have a person to interface with. And people pay a lot more to have somebody to build that relationship with and have somebody to ask questions with and talk to. So that's why our prices are probably a lot different than Bench as well. Another thing with Bench is they use their own proprietary software. So if you're planning to grow, typically most firms standardize on QuickBooks Online or Zero. So if you're on Bench and you plan to grow and you want to start plugging in third-party apps, you're going to be limited there and you're going to eventually have to move off of that anyway. So I would consider that when working with a firm that's on QBO or Zero versus going with something like Bench that ha- or another company that has their own proprietary software is once you outgrow them, 
you're going to have to do a migration of all your data. And if you outgrow your accountant and your accountant's using Zero, and then you find another one that's using QuickBooks, you'll have to do that too. Anytime you outgrow somebody is going to be a lot of change. I think in the beginning, you just want to be make sure that you're comfortable with who's doing it and that it's getting done correctly too. Okay. So let's say then you, and so we've talked about under a million, basically use of financials, file a tax return, basis of accounting is going to be cash basis. Maybe you have a solo bookkeeper, contract bookkeeper that's helping you on an hourly basis. Maybe you go to one of these firms that do taxes and bookkeeping. That's a really good solution at that stage. Now, as you start to approach or pass a million revenue, then you're starting to need your financials more to manage your business, right? Because you've got more people on payroll, you've got vendors, you've got more no customers. money, no problem. <laughs> you've got, you need to start developing basic KPIs. You may need to start add on different tools like a spend management card or a bill pay software, payment processor, all of these things that get into what some of us in the industry call FinOps or financial operations. So as you get those, this is when people are going to start to need financials for a lot more than just taxes. Yes. So this is when you're actually going to be looking at your financials to understand if your margins are good, how that compares to industry standards or what your target is. And so this is, so everyone that we've standardized on accrual-based accounting, that's the way we, our default is. So we don't even do cash basis accounting anymore. And that's why we ended up saying, okay, under a million is not good for us because they may not need that high, that much yeah, level of service. It's overkill for them. So when we get on a cruel basis, then it allows us to start looking at margins. It gives us the foundation to start doing forecasting if we need to. Gives you a lot more clarity on the health of the business as well in real time. Exactly. So then if we get in, if we move up the scale, right? So you may be managed, you may be using your financials to manage your business, but maybe you're the only owner, maybe you have a partner and you're, you are the only people that are using your financial statements to run the business. Now, the next level up from that would be now you have third party reliance on your financial statements. And in that case, you need to tighten things up. So you may have a bank that's looking at your financials, or maybe you want to get to loan. You may have investors who are looking at financials or you're trying to get investors. So this is anytime you need some more money to run the business, somebody's going to be making sure that they're going to get a return on that money and they want to see these numbers. They want to get clarity on, on who they're lending to. Yes. And they need to be clean and tight because as soon as if you give over sloppy financial statements, you've immediately lost trust. And for someone to give you money, you need to be trusted, trustworthy. So part of that is putting together really, really good financial statements on what I would call, I call this gap-ish. <laughs> gap-ish. Gap-ish, meaning it's not strict gap. Right. Let's define what gap is for our listeners. Yeah. So GAP stands for generally accepted accounting principles. And it's basically to get your CPA license, you learn GAP, what GAP is. And it's the, any public, publicly traded company has to follow these accounting standards. It's basically a uniform way of doing accounting. Is it just the United States? So there's IFRS, which is actually GAP moved to IFRS, I believe. I, I haven't, I took my CPA license or um, tests a long time ago. But GAP is what's used in the United States and IFRS is what's used internationally. Anyway, Just to be like, clear for any of our international listeners. The, the point is, so if you ever had a CPA friend who doesn't do taxes, they probably do audits. And what the auditors do is they go into businesses or nonprofits, they test and say, okay, these financials that somebody else is relying on are, are good. Like, Wait, there's not an IRS audit, right? No, not an IRS audit, a financial statement audit. And, and so that's typically, another CPA that would be doing that financial statement audit, right? Yeah. So you may have an in-house accounting team or somebody else, or maybe even outsourced doing your accounting. And then this third party CPA firm comes in and says, yeah, these people are doing their accounting correct. They're not hiding things. They're not misstating information because you as a third party are relying on them. So the third party wants a third party <laughs> to well, then come in and, and say that the financials are okay. That's an important delineation for what different accountants do. 
because you got one accountant that's handling your books in-house that's doing that and then another accountant that's looking over what that accountant's doing. That CPA that's doing the audit, that's not the one you're going to be working with. That's Well, actually, you would be working with both, two different CPAs yeah. in that scenario, right? Yeah, you might have a tax CPA and then an Three. auditor CPA, and then you may have a CPA in-house working for you, depending. This, the in-house person may not be a CPA, but they may have a CPA background where they either started tax or audit and then came in-house and worked for you. Yeah, that's confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You almost have a full house of accountants. Yeah. So, so three of a kind. Um, and yeah, typically a good in-house accountant comes from a audit back gap background because they know how to do it correctly. So right. when I go, so going back to that third party reliance. So again, investors or bank, the, you may not in those situations, the bank or investors may not require an audit. So you don't have to be, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like if you do, let's say you do an addition or remodel your home. And technically you're supposed to go get a permit, right? But let's say you want to save money. So you don't get a permit. So you do it and it's totally fine. The house stands up. It's fine. But like, you don't it have to do it. It stands up ish. It stands up ish. It's, it's pretty good. It's good enough for you, right? Like, but you're, but you're no inspector is coming in to say, yeah, you did this correctly. That's kind of what this is, right? There's no third party coming to verify that it's correct. So as long as it's good enough for the bank and it's good enough for the investors and it's good enough for you to run your business, you're okay. Ish. Ish. I mean, it's also, it, would that be also somebody trying to avoid the increase in tax value of the house too? Because that potentially would be be another scenario where you're trying to save on taxes. Yeah, that could be. We're not advocating yeah. for this. But. And I talk about this because Mike's in construction. So not that he would ever do anything like that. Okay. So then we're getting into when do you actually need full. And after this, we'll back into, okay, who do you need in each, each of these situations and help you. So then we get into gap basis, strict gap. And so this is when you actually have somebody coming and auditing you. So typically nonprofits have to be, get audited yep. of a certain size. We've got VC backed companies that investors as part of investing, they say you need a, an annual audit or a review, which is just like a le lesser version of an audit. Publicly so, traded companies. Publicly traded companies. So in those situations, you need people on your team or people that you're outsourcing the accounting to that have a CPA background that do that are up to date on like the latest gap regulations because it can change. It's kind of like the tax code. There's new standards can come out. So you have CP and all that that you need to be up to date. For most businesses, this is super overkill. You don't need to be on strict gap. You need to be on some sort of accrual based accounting that you can use to make good business decisions. So that gets into when you're buying accounting services and if you, one thing I go back and forth with is like, does industry expertise matter when you're buying services? And I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. But for nonprofits and anybody who's, you know, maybe a VC backed company who is getting audited, you probably like in industry expertise may matter in that situation more than more than others. Well, I think the more that you can do and more than you could help somebody, the more that industry experience matters. So if you want to go deeper and you want to help somebody a lot more than you need to know about their industry, you need to know the problems that they run into. I guess when it comes to an account, somebody, a small business owner looking for an accountant, how much does it matter for them to find somebody that works with them? That could matter a whole lot. If they are looking at two different accountants and one of them works with them, specifically like works with just attorneys and they're an attorney's office wouldn't you rather work with that person that works with you or i mean that's that's what i would think as a buyer i would like to find something but i also understand that it's going to cost a lot more too so usually if you're comparing two services i could see one that markets to any general small business maybe their price is a thousand and then another one that markets directly to us and I am a, uh, I don't know, I, I'm a swim instructor. I have a team of, I, I have, I'm a diving coach and I have yeah. a team of divers and I have an accountant that works with me specifically. <laughs> I, I don't know how much that matters. It depends on the size of the business too, but where, yeah, where, where's your I, head at here? I go back and forth with this. So I think both of our firms are pretty generalist in terms of like- Who we take on. We have a lot of clients, our industries we don't take on. And then we have like five or so that we do. But then there's all this- 
brand of businesses in between that maybe don't fit in any of those categories specifically. I think that in our industry, a lot of people are pushing, you need to choose a niche from a marketing perspective. So some people are just throwing out and saying, I work with this type of business. And then they're actually not very good <laughs> at what they do, but their marketing's good. So buyer goes I, in accounting, accounting principles, like I could look at any business and from an accounting perspective, figure out how to do the accounting for it because accounting principles are all about, it's the same. So I think it depends on if you're getting into like advisory level or operational consulting, and that's what you're asking for from your account. You're going firm. beyond the financials. I think you're going beyond the financials and you're getting into consulting. You will at least want to make sure that they've worked with one or two of your type of business before or similar business model. Because you get into like service-based businesses, right? The model is still the same. Well, I tend to agree with you on the fact that if you're just doing everything that we've talked about on this show, you're doing books, you're doing accounting, you're doing financials, you're doing forecasting, all those types of things. I think it's better to find a really good accountant and a good team that knows what they're doing than if it's just somebody that works with your industry. But if you are looking for somebody that would be a coach or consulting and it has a more of a relationship to help you with your business specifically and working with you one-on-one, -on -one, then you might want somebody that really can speak your language, your business language. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, my advice is accounting below doesn't really matter. If you find somebody who's been in your shoes before and has made it, like that's the best advice you can get. And that may not be a financial person. That may just be like somebody who's owned a business like you have before or some sort of coaching program or something. That's going to be more valuable. And that could be somebody that's marketing directly to you because they can speak your language because they know you. They were you. Yeah. So there's a different way. So uh, under a million we talked about, and as so then we're looking at that million to 10 million in revenue. And I say one to 10 and stop there because typically there's going to be a certain point where you want to hire in-house because if you're outsourcing, it's going to become, eventually it'll become more cost effective to hire in-house. So in that one to 10 million revenue range, again, going back to who we need, you kind of need a bookkeeper, you need a controller, and you may need a piece of a CFO. So there's a few different ways that you can structure this. You can decide, I want to outsource everything to one firm. Maybe they play the bookkeeper, controller, and CFO role. Or you might have a in-house, maybe you grow big enough where you have like an in-house bookkeeper or in-house accountant, and then you bring in a fractional CFO. Typically, you don't see a full-time CFO in a fractional like accounting department, outsourced accounting department, because you want to bring in the most expensive person you'll bring in last. And so typically, it's like bookkeeper would be your first internal hire as you start to grow. I, I like that because that is that is typically what happens. And as businesses grow from 10 to 12 million, they're thinking about IPOs and other types of things maybe not always ipos mm, yeah no um, i wouldn't be not at that stage those are yeah this is really we're talking maybe SaaS and startups and stuff like that but as they get a lot bigger yeah they're going to be a lot more geographically spread out too possibly multiple locations you know what, what are they looking at for an in-house accounting team uh, and do they grow with within the life cycle of working with you let's say have you had a client grow out of you it doesn't happen very often. And when, when they do, it's usually like a tech company. So they get another round of funding and it's like all of a sudden, okay, they're hiring all in-house. Yeah, um, that's the one I, that's going to also want to go public at some point too. Right. And I, I would recommend always having somebody outsource involved. So even if you decide to hire an in-house bookkeeper, maybe you're still outsourcing that controller role for some oversight. You know, Maybe it's only five hours a month. But within an accounting department, you always want at least two people one, because as soon as you add a second person, it re significantly reduces your risk of fraud. I think it's like 99% of time fraud occurs as one person acting alone. So there's that part of it controls, but there's also the continuity. So like this happens all the time with business owners is they, they, they go hire a senior accountant or something. And then that person is the only accountant at that company. So they're not very happy as so they leave or they get sick. And then this really critical function now, there's nobody that can step in. So we've had that situation happen before where a client will hire in-house, but then we're still doing like a small piece of it. And then if that person's out or something happens, we've been able to quickly step in. We have all the context of the business and it just gives that a business owner peace of mind having that second person Can you give there. me an example of why a business would need investors at a certain stage or why they need a loan? This is as they're approaching that like... 
2 million, 3 million mark? Yeah. So investors typically for businesses, like our traditional startup that you think of, right? They're typically building something to sell. And so they have all these costs that go into research and development, coders, all the people that you need to develop a product so that they can sell it for a lot later down the road. So investors are taking a big risk. That sounds like a software company. Yeah, software. And typically we're not seeing investors in like professional service. I mean, we, we kind of are in our industry seeing that happen, but it's not very common because typically as a professional service business, one, you can be profitable right away, so you don't need outside capital. And two, you just can't scale professional service businesses as fast as you can with the tech startup because you have to, it involves people and onboarding people is yep. <laughs> not easy at, at, fast, at scale. So and, I think that the time a professional services may want to consider investors or anything like that is if they are attempting to acquire more and they want to grow and grow and grow. And if that's the case, and you're trying to have the illusion of scale and the illusion of a lot of growth, then you're going to need investors. You're going to need somebody to continue to feed that beast, to buy more, to buy more and to continue to grow like that and to build something that's really big. I think that would be the case. That's a a really good point. Uh, And like in our industry, you know, get to 10 million revenue is is crazy. It's, It's really, really big. Well, you do that through acquisition. Most people, most people that are doing that are doing it through acquisition because it's just so hard to staff up as you continue to grow like that, that you need to acquire businesses just for their teams too sometimes. Yep, exactly. And then to answer your question on getting a loan. So businesses that have a model where they have to incur a lot of costs before they generate revenue and then receive cash wouldn't potentially need a loan to cover that cash conversion cycle. So businesses with inventory often need line of credit because they have to go buy the inventory, then they have to store it, then they have to sell it. And so like, how do they go? Where does that capital come from for them to go initially buy that inventory so they can sell it down the road? All right. Yeah. So that's a very good point. And as we continue to further narrow our focus of who we're talking about, we'll know why they need loans too. So I appreciate that. um, And on that note, as soon as you have investors or you're trying to get investors or you have a bank that you're working with or you're trying to get a loan, you need somebody who can have high level conversations with your banker or the investors. So when you're thinking about, I want that, like make sure you're working with somebody that has experience telling because with a lot of. um, Well, it becomes that third party ish. You're that third party. The, yes. Another third yeah. party. Yeah, yeah, because translate. you're um, you're creating credibility, especially with like banks and stuff. A lot of CFOs will have relationships with banks, and so they know, like, hey, if you work with Sally, she's she brings us clients all the time, and she's their CFO, and their financials are always good. We trust Sally. We trust her. She's not going to give us these bogus fake financials. It's all about creating trust. Yeah, um, and then being able to tell the story. So if you're you know a business that's struggling financially and you're trying to renew a loan or get another loan, you have to be able to tell the story of like how you're going to be profitable. Same thing. How are you going to turn things around? What got you there? Yeah. We get, were they getting investors, right? You're telling the story about how you have nothing right now, but it's going to be worth $20 million in three years. I promise you. So somebody has got to be convincing and they got to put the pitch deck together and they got to tell the story. Well, cool. I think that we've kind of covered how to purchase accounting services i mean everybody's going to be in a different boat everybody in a different scenario and if you listener are listening and you need accounting services we're here for you we're both taking on clients depends on your size depends on who would be the best fit yeah and your needs yeah so if you're above million revenue you're getting into that financial ops needs momentumaccounting.com paget nc yeah paget nc.com if you're smaller than a million or if you just need cash basis and you just need somebody for your taxes. Cool. Yeah. I think that hopefully that answers some questions. I don't know that, that we've got into like the different types of like what you can buy. I don't know. Do we, do we answer the question? I think well, we, we, we help people self-identify what they need. So at least they can have that conversation when they're interviewing people. Yeah. I think we've armed them with what types of questions to ask, but everybody's going to have different questions. Every business is at a different stage. And we we really just, this first track is just the highest level overview of everything potentially that they could run into. And I think we'd be good. Like if anybody's in the search 
for accounting services, they know that they're, we know that they're getting confused. We know that yeah. out there, there's a lot of noise. I spent about 20, 30 minutes just looking at different accounting firm websites yesterday. And they all kind of say the same thing, but they're all generally very bland and boring. And so I, I think that somebody searching for accounting services already, you know, it, you're not looking for something that exciting, but you need to understand like what everybody's offering and everybody, everyone that I looked at is talking about what they do in their own way. And most of it is giving you peace of mind. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of business owners at that stage are already in a mess and, or they, they have had an issue. They have a problem that they need solved. And most of that most of the time, that problem is something that they don't understand. They don't understand their books. They don't understand why the numbers are off or what it is they need. So they need to find that tr translator or that person that can do that for them. So I don't know. In this stage, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Oh, I think one thing we should also answer is how much you should pay for accounting services. Oh, great point. Yeah. I didn't see because, many prices when I was looking at the websites. Yeah. So typically I say 1% to 3% of revenue should be oh. spent on your entire accounting function. So that would be AP, AR, bookkeeper, controller, CFO services. So like more cash sensitive types of businesses or businesses with like a lot of transactions will be more expensive to maintain, right? Versus SaaS or professional service is going to be less expensive to maintain. But looking at it as a percentage of revenue is a great way to kind of even out the scale. Yeah. And that's how I, I always, when I'm putting together a proposal and we have a pricing structure, but I always do a gut check to say, does this make sense with their revenue? Because if it's like 5% of the revenue, I'm like, this is too expensive for them. And I'm also taking into consideration who they have internally that may be doing, you know, maybe they have a part-time AP person. And so I'm thinking about that too, and their total costs and trying to keep it within that range. Great point. Great point. I think we're going to start go back to that. We used to look at a percentage of revenue and everything. And I think we got away from that. So it's a good, uh, it's, it's a good, a good gut tool. check. And it usually does Great fall within in that range. Oh, well, thank you for tuning in to the cash flow show. Peace out, homies. Peace out, Nick. Bye, Scott. See you next time. Issues. You run a business, but feel like it's running you. Customers won't pay. But you got bills due. It appears you won't have enough for payroll coming up soon. It seems like you're running nowhere fast. You work hard, but never able to withdraw cash from the business. You get more customers, hire more employees, but still take home hardly anything. You feel like you're on a hamster wheel, frustrated because the battle's always uphill. Even though you got a bookkeeper on your team, they send you reports, but you don't really know what they mean. Your CPA doesn't understand a thing about your business. At least that's how it seems. But if you want to get above water and grow, check out the Cash Flow Show. This is the Cash Flow Show, where we help the small business gain momentum and become profitable. This is the Cash Flow Show. Listen and learn. We'll show you how to pay yourself on what your business earns. Like getting paid on time, profitability, and managing your bottom line, payroll best practices, the best apps to use, and cash flow forecasting tools. So if you're a small business owner, your help's right around the corner. Fret not, tune in as Scott and Nicole help you reach your goals on the Cash Flow this Show. Is the Cash Flow Show, where we help the small business gain momentum and become profitable. This is the Cash
flower advice will take you far. Cash flow show. Tune in with Nicole and OKR. Okay